And I'll be uh, talking to you about pericardial diseases. And uh, I do not uh, have uh, uh, any financial relationship with the industry. I like to emphasize that uh, there is a spectrum of uh, pericardial diseases, uh, pericarditis, uh, pericardial effusion, tamponade, and constrictive pericarditis. And this uh, different uh, stages of uh, pericardial diseases can transition uh, to uh, another stage, uh, depending on the, uh, 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 the course of the uh, pericardial uh, problems. And uh, today I like to describe the uh, differential diagnosis, and natural history, and also the uh, symptoms and physical findings and uh, evaluation modalities and also treatment modalities of uh, uh, this uh, uh, spectrum of, of uh, pericardial uh, disease uh, for you. Pericardium, as you know, uh, uh, really does not have any major vital function. Uh, there are two layers, of visceral and parietal pericardium, and uh, the pericardium uh, limits the acute cardiac distension and also it lubricates and the anchors the heart in the right place but it does not really uh, have any vital function and we can live without the pericardium uh, with no problems at all. But it really uh, presents a real problem when the pericardium becomes abnormal, uh, when it becomes uh, inflamed, uh, it causes a pericarditis, and the fluid uh, causes uh, effusion and tamponade, and also a scar uh, will cause uh, a significant uh, heart failure and constrictive uh, pericarditis. So let's just discuss the uh, acute and recurrent pericarditis first. If you uh, uh, look at this patient, uh, that uh, very uh, typical patient, uh, you know, who presents uh, with the uh, left arm pain and chest pain for an hour, and the troponin is elevated in the emergency department with the electrocardiogram uh, showing ST elevation. And I think that the most of us make the diagnosis of a STEMI and may uh, proceed with the urgent cardiac catheterization uh, because of the concern for acute coronary syndrome uh, in this 45-year-old with the SD elevation. But if you look at the uh, electrocardiogram, uh, we uh, may be or should be able to separate acute pericarditis from acute uh, myocardial infarction and STEMI because the uh, in Acute pericarditis, uh, ST elevation uh, is uh, more diffuse and has more of a concave upward uh, configuration. And uh, compared to the STEMI, this is more localized. In this case, it's anterior uh, wall STEMI with a convex upward. So configuration for acute pericarditis is a little happier with the uh, concave upward and uh, not that happy uh, with the uh, STEMI uh, presentation with the uh, con convex upward. So I think that electrocardiogram may be able to uh, help you uh, diagnose the uh, pericarditis and distinguish it uh, from uh, acute uh, STEMI and uh, may be able to save the uh, urgent um, uh, cardiac catheterization. The Acute pericarditis then is related to the uh, inflammation of the pericardium and may uh, not have any uh, fluid uh, on echocardiography and most of times is related to a virus infection. And you know, uh, you know well uh, how they present, a very ch sharp chest pain, uh, it bothers or gets worse with inspiration and also the certain movements. And if you uh, listen carefully, uh, the uh, uh, you may hear pericardial rub of uh, two or three components. And uh, in terms of the uh, laboratory testing, the CRP, this inflammatory biomarker, is usually uh, elevated uh, during the acute pericarditis. And uh, it can also involve the myocardium, so troponin can be elevated. As in this particular patient, I presented to you with the uh, myo uh, pericarditis. Again, echocardiography can be uh, completely normal uh, with the uh, no regional wall motion abnormality, as you expect in patients with the uh, acute myocardial infarction and STEMI, and no pericardial effusion in more than uh, 60 to 70 percent of uh, times. And the most uh, most sensitive uh, imaging uh, to diagnose uh, acute pericarditis, even recurrent pericarditis, is a cardiac MRI, as I uh, show you here, with a delayed enhancement. Uh, 
that the, uh, this uh, white line uh, with uh, gadolinium uh, delayed enhancement is very uh, uh, sensitive for detecting uh, uh, acute pericardial inflammation and pericarditis. And usually it's, uh, it's uh, in the inferior infralateral area. It's kind of interesting, I don't know why. Uh, and also the uh, myocarditis happens uh, most commonly at the inferior uh, infralateral uh, uh, segments uh, with the uh, pericarditis here. The, what about treatment? I think treatment is very important because the, uh, uh, you know, all of, us, all of us know we have to treat patients with chest pain, and uh, I re recommend that we do with NSAID, uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, or indocin uh, for at least one month, and also uh, colchicine for uh, three months, 0.6 milligram twice daily. Uh, because of the, uh, 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 this recurrence rate, recurrence rate is much lower uh, if you combine colchicin with the NSAID, 10% versus 32.3% uh, uh, in this particular uh, uh, communications. And uh, I also like to emphasize the uh, duration of a treatment because we tend to treat just the duration of the chest pain and we stop. But the inflammation really lasts almost three months to six months. Uh, if you do a serial uh, cardiac MRI uh, in this patient population. So we uh, uh, want to make sure that the patient uh, take the NSAID for three, one month and colchicin for three months, whether they uh, have a chest pain or not. And then it's important that we avoid steroid as a initial treatment because the recurrence rate is almost double uh, with the uh, steroid. And one area that uh, we don't really emphasize in this uh, patient population is avoidance of uh, vigorous exercise. And I usually say for about three months. You can do you know, usual uh, uh, regular activities, but vigorous exercise with the tachycardia will uh, uh, reactivate the inflammation of the pericardium, make things worse. And the most common scenario for uh, uh, recurrent pericarditis is a young individuals chest pain with acute pericarditis, and we treat them uh, with the NSAID and colchicin, uh, and the pain goes away uh, you know, a couple of weeks, and the uh, first thing they do is that they just go out and then run or do uh, very vigorous activities, and then a couple of days later, they come back with uh, a recurrent uh, pericarditis. So I think it's very important that we uh, uh, treat them uh, one month of NSAID and three months of colchicin and avoid vigorous exercise uh, in this uh, clinical setting. Women, uh, compared to men, uh, large effusion, uh, tamponade, and failure to respond to the NSAID or initial steroid use, all of them are associated with uh, increased complication uh, as a, a higher recurrence. And the uh, uh, more effusion with the tamponade, only 3%. The constricted pericarditis with uh, acute pericarditis is uh, relatively uncommon, although they may have a transient uh, constrictive process. So they may be short of breath, jugular venous pressure may be a little bit elevated because of the inflamed pericardium, but most of the time that constrictive uh, hemodynamics uh, resolve spontaneously or with the uh, uh, NSAID and colchicin. So chronic constriction is uh, relatively uh, uh, uncommon in this uh, clinical uh, setting. What about, um, you know, the patients who uh, return uh, three months, six months later with the uh, similar chest pain uh, with a recurrent pericarditis? It is uh, quite challenging, as you know, in the clinical practice. It is very difficult to diagnose because uh, the electrocardiogram does not show uh, ST elevation. Uh, there, there is no uh, pericardial rub, but they probably do have uh, increased uh, CRP and also the uh, uh, cardiac MRI will show you pericardial inflammation. So we used uh, those two things, uh, CRP and set rate, and the cardiac imaging with the uh, cardiac MRI to uh, uh, document uh, recurrent pericarditis. And once we are sure that patient has a recurrent pericarditis, we, uh, a treatment is similar to acute pericarditis with the combination of the uh, uh, NSAID and colchicin. Uh, because without colchicin, uh, recurrence rate is again, uh, is almost 40%. And still, uh, I would not use steroid up to a third and fourth time of recurrence. Uh, the, uh, the difference here uh, from the acute pericarditis treatment is that uh, we uh, use uh, NSAID for uh, three months and colchicin for six months 
to make sure that we minimize the uh, uh, another recurrence of uh, pericarditis. And if you treat, you know, three, four uh, recurrences and still having trouble with NSAID and colchicin, then I think it's reasonable to go ahead with the prednisone, 0.5 milligram to uh, one milligram per kilogram of body weight. Uh, and then uh, uh, slowly taper over three to six months period uh, in that uh, particular uh, setting. If all fails, uh, even steroid, it's very hard time uh, taper that off. Uh, you started with the 40 milligrams and down to 2.5 milligram, and patient's uh, chest pain comes back, and you go back again to uh, 20, 30 milligrams. It's a lot of lot of problems, and you don't know what to do. And uh, uh, I think that uh, this. Uh, Sub-Q medication uh, with the interleukin-1 interference or TREP medication, uh, the Kineret uh, or uh, Rylonosep uh, can be a, a significant help. Again, uh, this is a, a Sub-Q uh, injection and uh, uh, usually it takes at least six months of treatment, sometimes to 18 months. And uh, one of the uh, major uh, drawback of uh, this medication is that you know, close to half of time, the patients uh, may not be able to taper uh, this medication off. And, uh, uh, but they have a very prompt response. Uh, pain goes away, and also you, are, uh, you may be able to uh, taper uh, steroid therapy pretty quickly uh, within uh, uh, weeks to a month, uh, in, within a month period uh, in this uh, medication uh, here. This uh, right illness have just published a couple uh, months ago uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Ellen uh, Lewis, was of, uh, one of the uh, uh, co-investigators of uh, this particular uh, clinical trials. We also recommend uh, pericardiectomy. Uh, sounds very aggressive and, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, drastic uh, in some patients with the recurrent pericarditis, but when you suffer from multiple recurrences, and if you don't want to take the uh, steroid, and also you don't want to be uh, uh, taking a sub injection for six to 18 months, and I think the pericardiectomy uh, by a very experienced hand, the surgeon, uh, may not be a good, uh, uh, may not be a, a, a bad uh, 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 treatment modality uh, for that, and then we publish our experience uh, here, and then after surgery, almost 95% of them uh, well, free of chest pain, and also the uh, we're able to uh, taper all the medications uh, for uh, uh, recurrent pericarditis uh, in the uh, long-term follow-up, as you see uh, here. So this is another option that uh, we need to uh, consider and discuss uh, with the patient who has multiple uh, recurrence of uh, pericarditis. Let's uh, move on to uh, pericardial effusion and tamponade, and uh, these are the three patients on echocardiography. Uh, having small, moderate, and large amount of uh, pericardial effusion. This is echo-free space there. And we define a small effusion as uh, less than 10 millimeter of a fluid or space here uh, during diastole, and 10 to 20 millimeter moderate and more than 20 millimeter as a large uh, pericardial uh, effusion. And also uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, use a chest x-ray. Um, uh, chest x-ray suggests uh, effusion by globular shape, as you see here, and also CT and cardiac MRI are very uh, uh, good uh, imaging modality to detect amount of uh, uh, and the location of uh, pericardial effusion, as you see uh, here. How do we manage, uh, you know, uh, asymptomatic or uh, incidental findings of effusion or sometimes uh, uh, hemodynamically significant pericardial effusion? This is a, a guideline and recommendation from European Society of Cardiology. Uh, we do not have uh, American Society uh, guidelines for managing uh, pericardial effusion, but I agree with what uh, ESC recommends. So uh, you look at the uh, hemodynamic abnormality uh, or uh, etiology of a, a bacterial infection or neoplastic etiology, is most, uh, you know, the best treatment at that particular time is uh, pericardiosynthesis uh, to manage that. And if not, uh, look at the uh, CRP. Uh, if that's elevated, uh, you want to treat that patient with the uh, uh, NSAID and colchicin. And then, uh, if not, and you look at the uh, uh, 
underlying ideology and you treat that. And also you look at the amount of effusion if it's uh, large. And actually the recommendation here, even moderate amount of a pericardial effusion, even if not symptomatic, it may not be unreasonable to uh, proceed with the pericardial synthesis, uh, if not uh, uh, therapeutically, but uh, for diagnostically, uh, we recommend that. Uh, well, sometimes even large effusion asymptomatic patient, you may want to treat NSAID and the colchicine for uh, six weeks or so, and then uh, follow that up with, uh, with the patient with echocardiography and see how a patient's uh, uh, doing. The, uh, uh, this is uh, one interesting uh, situation uh, with the chylose effusion, and this is a uh, uh, milkish uh, fluid uh, from the uh, pericardial sac, and usually related to the uh, thoracic duct obstruction uh, shown by uh, lymphangiogram. This is uh, one case that we uh, experienced uh, and reported, and then this uh, was managed by the uh, anastomosis of, uh, of uh, 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 thoracic duct uh, 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 to the uh, uh, internal jugular vein uh, uh, by Dr. Klevitsky uh, in vascular surgery uh, many years ago. So I thought this is an interesting uh, entity that we should be, uh, uh, be aware of. What about tamponade? I think the uh, tamponade is uh, uh, a situation where the uh, amount of uh, pericardial fluid in the per uh, fluid increase the pressure in the pericardial sac and actually they exceeds the pressure of the right side of the heart and then you uh, impede uh, the uh, filling of the uh, right side of the heart so that the uh, stroke volume goes down and cardiac output goes down, the patient becomes hypotensive and even have a cardiogenic shock. And echocardiographically, we see the uh, uh, right ventricle collapse during early diastole and we see the right atrial collapse during the uh, late diastole, and also uh, someone with a large effusion, you may have a swinging motion of the heart uh, back and forth, as you see uh, here. But the uh, amount of a fluid uh, is not always uh, associated with the hemodynamic abnormality of the pericardial effusion. Its most important thing is the rate of accumulation. And this is a patient who uh, just underwent the, uh, um, underwent, uh, uh, the uh, uh, cardiac intervention and then became hypotensive, very small amount of a fluid here, but hypotensive because of the very rapid accumulation of 100, 200 cc of fluid. Uh, but this patient, uh, large effusion, it took probably uh, many months to accumulate and uh, uh, you know, patient may not even hypotensive with that, may, that much of a fluid, as you see here. This is a 51-year-old patient with the lupus, and the blood pressure was 150, not hypotensive, even hypertensive, when, they, uh, when he had almost four liters of a fluid, and the main, compo main problem uh, uh, patient was experiencing was uh, actually the right upper quadrant pain. They end up even doing the ultrasound of the, of the, uh, of the abdomen because of the pain. Uh, that pain was coming from the uh, uh, liver, hepatic uh, venous congestion, uh, right heart failure, okay? And also patients, because of the swinging motion of the heart, uh, they have the, uh, this a typical electrical alternance. The swinging motion of the heart uh, makes the uh, position of the uh, heart uh, very different from the, uh, the uh, chest wall so that electrical uh, uh, configuration, QRS uh, axis uh, uh, you know, changes uh, between the uh, cardiac cycle length cycles right here. So uh, the electrical alternate is the uh, manifestation of the swing, swinging motion of the heart uh, with a large amount of uh, pericardial effusion as you see. As you see. And we also see uh, more frequent uh, hemopericardium. And this is uh, uh, Dr. Kane and the uh, uh, group, uh, our pericardial synthesis group at Mayo Clinic uh, put together and showing the uh, instance of uh, hemopericardium for the last 10 years, which is a lot more frequent uh, than the uh, serous and the serous angulus now compared to previous years because of the uh, interventional procedures. Uh, we are doing a lot of device uh, closures and device uh, uh, procedures in the cardiac cath registration laboratory, uh, EP procedures and all of that. And also the uh, cardiac surgical procedures and they are uh, very uh, uh, 
uh, increasing so that we are seeing a lot more hemopericardium as, a, uh, as an etiology of uh, a cardiac tamponade. And we can diagnose that by echocardiography, and uh, we look at respiratory variation of the mitral inflow velocity, and also the very typical uh, hepatic vein uh, Doppler tracing uh, abnormality, as you uh, 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 see here as we published uh, many years ago. Once uh, we uh, uh, decide to do pericardiosynthesis for the tamponade or uh, uh, diagnostically, we use echocardiography, as Dr. Seward is doing, and we identify the uh, location, uh, best location for the uh, uh, pericardial fluid, and uh, 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 then we uh, uh, perform uh, the procedure from that location. And uh, it used to be subcostal view, uh, blindly, but we now, uh, with echocardiography guidance, about almost 80% of times, pericardiosynthesis is, uh, is done uh, from the apical uh, position, as you see it here. I once, sometimes when you see bloody fusion, you are concerned that the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, your needle uh, for pericardiosynthesis may be inside of the heart not in the pericardial sac. So what we do is that we uh, inject the agitated saline, as you see here, and we feel very relieved when you see these uh, white uh, bubbles uh, in the pericardial sac here, not in the uh, cardiac uh, chambers, okay? When we see pericardial diffusion, uh, we have to always consider underlying etiology because a pericardial fluid is not primary problem, it's related to something different, right? and uh, especially urgent situation, as you see here. And this is a very uh, typical appearance of the uh, hemopericardium. You see the uh, kind of uh, a snake-like motion of uh, coagulum in the pericardial sac. And then we look at the uh, aorta. Patient has the uh, uh, typical aortic dissection with the intramural hematoma, an urgent situation. And there is a why patient had this uh, 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 hemopericardium and the coagulum tamponade. Another uh, interesting uh, case uh, we saw many years ago, this uh, uh, middle-aged man uh, presented with a chest pain and shortness of breath and has a history of a pulmonary embolism, and then he uh, has an IVC filter uh, many years ago, I think eight years prior, and, uh, and then when he looked at him in the emergency room, he had the uh, small, a moderate amount of uh, pericardial effusion, but in addition, there's a kind of strange uh, 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 appearance of, uh, of a line here uh, between the left and right side chambers, and this is a, a 3D echocardiography also showing some uh, little line, and we decide to proceed with the uh, cardiac CT, and this is a CT showing a, a needle like the uh, structure coming from outside of the heart to the RV, to the L uh, septum, to the left ventricle. Again, you, you see the, uh, this uh, uh, fine line uh, uh, over there. And uh, based on that, we uh, decided to operate on this patient. And uh, this was uh, actually uh, very interesting in that patient had the IVC filter eight years earlier, and it you know, usually had to be removed uh, six months to a year uh, uh, later, right? But uh, was left there and never removed. And one of the uh, struts, and there were six of them there eight years later, and one of them uh, uh, dislodged and went into the heart and then poked through the uh, right ventricle, uh, right, H, you know, right side of the heart and the septum uh, all the way to the uh, left uh, ventricle. So this was a very typical, uh, the broken heart. Uh, causing the uh, pericardial effusion and the uh, tamponade in this patient. Let's move on to uh, uh, effusive constrictive. This is an intermediate stage from uh, a fluid to the uh, constriction. And uh, this is very important uh, ideology to, uh, to identify and uh, manage. Uh, because if you don't treat effusive constrictive uh, process uh, adequately, uh, the patient may, uh, you know, uh, proceed to uh, to uh, to uh, 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 chronic constriction, which may require cardiac surgery uh, later on. So this is a, a, a typical example: a 27-year-old uh, uh, man who presented with acute pericarditis with a large amount of uh, pericardial effusion and treated with the uh, uh, pericardial window. But the patient's uh, uh, not really feeling well at all, and then he ended up developing right upper quadrant pain. 
and they again, uh, because of the right upper quadrant pain, they did ultrasound, they saw something in the gallbladder, so they decided to uh, uh, proceed with the uh, cholecystectomy. And then his father uh, thought that uh, uh, something is not quite right, so uh, a father called us up and we are seeing him uh, uh, in our uh, 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 clinic, and then first thing we notice is that his uh, jugular venous pressure is very high and very rapid descent, uh, wide descent that uh, characteristic for patients with the uh, uh, constrictive uh, pericarditis. And then this echocardiography uh, shows the uh, typical uh, appearance of a constriction and the uh, IVC is a plethoric and the septum moves to the left with inspiration and move right uh, with expiration, which is a very characteristic uh, appearance of uh, uh, constrictive uh, pericarditis. You, you can see that here though, septum moves uh, uh, left and right uh, with the uh, uh, inspiration and expiration uh, here. And also we look at tissue Doppler and hepatic venous flow velocities, very characteristic uh, diastatic flow reversal with expiration uh, indicating the uh, uh, constriction. So this patient initially presented with the uh, fluid, uh, but then uh, fluid uh, 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 made the uh, uh, inflammation of the pericardium and then uh, you know, now becoming a scar a bit, you know, so it's causing significant uh, uh, constrictive pericarditis. This is another example. 77-year-old uh, patient is undergoing a TAB procedure for aortic valve stenosis and also required pacemaker implementation. And during the uh, procedure, you can again see that typical uh, coagulum tamponade because of the perforation probably uh, patient experience during this procedure. They removed the, uh, uh, some bloody fluid, not much, but patient improved. Patient went home, but came back two months later with uh, more problems, uh, more short of breath, uh, more uh, uh, edema uh, in his lower extremities. But now if you look at the pericardial sac, this is uh, uh, not fluid because the liver sort of moves with the right side chamber is very tethered because the pericardium is now thickened and inflamed and tethered to the uh, uh, liver capsule and the RV and uh, causing uh, a significant uh, constriction. Uh, as you see here again, the uh, septal motion is quite abnormal. Hepatic vein is uh, diagnostic for constriction and the mitral inflow velocity has a uh, respiratory variation. That's how we diagnose uh, constriction by uh, uh, echocardiography. And uh, uh, this is the data that uh, we show with a cardiac MRI uh, working with the, our uh, radiology multimodality imaging colleagues. And when someone has a uh, effusive constriction, and if they have uh, marked inflammation of the pericardium, as you see right here, is a circumferentially, uh, pericardium is quite thickened, very inflamed, as I showed you earlier. And in that particular situation, even with the constriction, we can treat medically and say, or if patient doesn't have a chest pain, you can treat it with a steroid very quickly, and then uh, patient's uh, constriction uh, uh, all resolved, and then inflammation is still there, is but much uh, improved compared to uh, the baseline, as you see on cardiac uh, MRI. And that patient's reversible constriction, we call transient constriction, uh, with the re uh, effusive constriction, their delayed enhancement is much thicker, and also uh, uh, biochemically, their sed rate and sed rate is much, much higher than patients with a persistent chronic uh, constrictive pericarditis. So we always uh, perform cardiac MRI to see whether patients can be treated medically, uh, uh, you know, uh, rather than uh, 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 with a surgical procedure for uh, uh, constrictive uh, pericarditis. And uh, if you see this patient uh, with the effusive constriction after cardiac surgery, and the patient underwent five, six different thoracentesis because of the recurrent uh, uh, pleural effusion, but we diagnosed the constriction after cardiac surgery, and the CT shows thickened pericardium, and one week of steroid therapy, everything resolved including the uh, 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 pericardial thickness and the uh, pleural effusion uh, over here. So this is a very good result of a medical therapy for transient effusive constrictive pericarditis. So uh, effusive constriction is a condition uh, where the uh, right atrial pressure and intra pericardial pressure is both elevated before uh, uh, any uh, uh, treatment with the pericardiosynthesis. And the usual setting without uh, effusive constriction, uh, 
the right atrial pressure and the intraperiocardial pressure both has to be normalized. But in patients with constrict, effusive constriction, intraperiocardial pressure, right, that it may be uh, normalized, but the right atrial pressure continues to be elevated because of the inflamed pericardium that we need to, uh, uh, to manage with the uh, anti-inflammatory uh, inflammatory medication. This is our data that we published uh, a, couple of year, a few years ago uh, of uh, 205 consecutive patients with uh, pericardiosynthesis. 16% of them develop eff effusive constriction. So it's, a, it's not an uncommon problem and more frequent in patients with a hemopericardium because this is more toxic, more damaging, more inflammation occur to the pericardium with the blood in the pericardial sac and uh, they have a higher uh, percent of uh, neutrophils. And then, uh, again, uh, we are able to manage them uh, with the anti-inflammatory medication. So only two of them require pericardectomy uh, after uh, almost four years of follow-up. But the previous report showing that almost half of the uh, effusive constriction required pericardectomy. So I think it's very important that uh, in patients uh, who undergo uh, pericardi uh, pericardiosynthesis, whether it's a hemopericardium or a, a serous uh, fluid, uh, we like to treat uh, those patients with at least one month of the uh, of uh, uh, NSAID uh, combined with the uh, uh, colchicine uh, therapy. Let's just move on to uh, uh, the chronic situation uh, with the uh, constricted pericarditis, and uh, it's a right heart failure and ascites, edema, abdominal pain, uh, uh, typical presentation. So many patients are seen in the GI unit because of the abdominal pain. Uh, clinically, uh, they have a very uh, rapid uh, descent uh, of the elevated jugular venous pressure, and the pericardial knock is uh, relatively common, and they also uh, present with the uh, pearl effusion seen in the uh, uh, pulmonary clinic not in the pericardial clinic uh, initially. So this is, uh, again, uh, uh, very typical patients after cardiac surgery, which is the most common cause of constriction nowadays. You can see that the uh, jugular venous pressure is very high and the, uh, the, the very rapid wide descent uh, right here, early diastole, uh, the pressure drops very quickly because of the high pressure and then uh, tricuspid valve opens and then pressure drops very quickly that you see the uh, uh, ray, uh, rapid wide descent. And that the volume hits the uh, ventricular wall and creates the uh, sounds we call, uh, we hear uh, that as a, a pericardial knock. So uh, very important to do a good clinical uh, examination to evaluate the constriction. So we uh, have a pericardial clinic at uh, Mayo, uh, 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 Rochester uh, we meet, uh, we see patients uh, uh, one week, uh, one day a week, and uh, we have uh, uh, nine uh, physicians uh, that are rotating through the uh, pericardial clinic uh, with the, uh, uh, the Tara, a uh, nurse, who helping us at the clinic. And this is a 53-year-old uh, woman I uh, saw uh, in November 19th and 2020, only uh, about a, uh, less than a month ago. A patient had bronchitis and severe viral infection about 18 years ago, and uh, she was sick for three months, but didn't really have any problem. But on chest x-ray in 2004, uh, so, uh, 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 you know, 16 years ago, uh, uh, she was told that, that there's uh, some calcification on the uh, pericardium, but she was uh, totally asymptomatic. Until uh, uh, August of 2020, uh, she presented with atrial fibrillation and treated with a cardiac, uh, DC cardioversion with a transesophageal echocardiography and the place on amiodarone and metoprolol to uh, control her atrial fibrillation. They also found uh, elevated uh, liver function test, and she was even told that she may have even liposirosis. Uh, but she was able to carry out daily activities, but to get some short of breath and uh, some limitation uh, if he, he, she does uh, uh, more than moderate uh, amount of uh, activities. So she was referred to us uh, what to do uh, about her uh, calcified pericardium. And constriction, uh, traditionally, uh, pericardial calcification on CT or chest X-ray, uh, the pericardial thickness may be increased uh, on echo, CT, and MRI, and also uh, this is uh, uh, supposed to be gold standard by cardiac catheterization. Uh, 
uh, with the increased right atrial pressure and equal ideation of the uh, LV and RV and diastatic pressure, but that also happens in patients with the myocardial disease. And PA systolic pressure is supposed to be less than 50, but almost a third of the patients we see now, because they are combined with the myocardial disease, uh, PA systolic pressure uh, is higher than 50 millimeter mercury. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a typical calcified pericardium, but only 27% of the, percent of the uh, uh, constricted patients do have uh, calcification in chest x-ray, and majority of them now uh, presents with the uh, no calcification. Used to be a tuberculosis pericarditis, but we don't have then, uh, many patients with a tuberculosis uh, in this country. Uh, but the, uh, many other uh, uh, countries in the world, still tuberculosis is one of the more common uh, cause of, the, uh, of uh, uh, constrictive uh, pericarditis. And we uh, uh, use echocardiography. Uh, for diagnosing constriction, and uh, we use the, uh, the annulus motion, early diastolic velocity, because the early diastolic velocity is uh, increased in constrictive pericarditis compared to the uh, patients with the myocardial disease. Because the myocardial disease, uh, the, uh, the myocardial relaxation is reduced, and the early diastolic velocity, we call E prime velocity, is a reflection of the uh, myocardial relaxation. So we are able to separate myocardial disease uh, from the constriction by just looking at the uh, uh, E-prime velocity by uh, echocardiography. So we uh, um, uh, uh, published the Mayo Clinic uh, echocardiographic diagnostic criteria. I mentioned to you a very uh, characteristic septal motion uh, because of the interventricular dependence of a constriction and much info velocity varies with the respiration and very restrictive uh, pattern. Uh, the uh, mitral annulus E prime velocity is uh, usually, uh, uh, you know, eight centimeter per second or higher, and then most uh, specific uh, parameter is the hepatic vein Doppler reversal with expiration, as you see uh, right here. And the cardiac ideation, uh, equalization of diastolic pressure, is a very uh, uh, non-specific because uh, uh, even restriction can have a restriction. Uh, can have the uh, equalization as uh, in constricted pericarditis, but what we need to do is looking at the uh, uh, concordance of the LV and RV pressure and restriction, discordant pressure, uh, the LV pressure falls with inspiration, but the RV systolic pressure goes up with inspiration and constriction, but the in restriction they changes together with inspiration and expression. This is a more specific sign of the hemodynamic, uh, uh, hemodynamics of constriction in the uh, cardiac catheterization. And also, the, uh, uh, we look at t Doppler here. Medial is higher than the lateral E-prime velocity, and then uh, cardiac MRI shows a septal motion change. Again, the, uh, some abnormal uh, motion of the, uh, uh, of the uh, 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 RV and also left ventricle. You can see in the cardiac MRI and also the uh, echocardiography. Uh, right here because of the uh, calcification or scar tissue of the pericardium. And the hepatic vein is uh, usually plethoric, uh, but it's a plethoric also in the restrictive cardiomyopathy. But the hepatic vein Doppler during expiration uh, reversal is very specific for constriction. In restricted cardiomyopathy, it happens with the uh, uh, inspiration, so we should be able to uh, separate it out uh, here. And I showed you, I mentioned to you that uh, many patients uh, present to the uh, GI unit first because of uh, abnormal liver function test and the patient has right upper quadrant pain with hepatomegaly. And you really have to, we all have to look at the uh, patient's jugular venous pressure, right? And uh, as you can see here, has a, uh, elevated jugular venous pressures and then rapid wide descent and then a uh, patient's uh, septal motion changes here. Uh, and this is very typical, again, uh, for constricted pericarditis uh, with the uh, clinical evaluation here, and then echocardiography, uh, cardiac MRI, and cardiac catheterizations. It's very, very important. Pericardiectomy uh, is the treatment for uh, 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 chronic constriction, especially when they have the uh, calcifications and uh, uh, you may not know this, but the pericardiectomy uh, was actually the first cardiac surgery in Mayo Clinic in 1936. And it was done even without the uh, 
uh, cardiopulmonary uh, bypass uh, at all. And from outside, uh, and they uh, removed the, uh, all the uh, calcifications and the thickened pericardium. And then that, uh, this is the second patient's uh, Mayo Clinic did with the constrictive uh, pericarditis with the pericardectomy. And it was reported in the uh, New York Times showing the, how much of weight the patient actually lost uh, after pericardectomy. And uh, this is a 20, I think, seven-year-old uh, uh, male from Australia uh, with the uh, diagnosis of constriction, and he was told that he was going to die soon. And the Mayo Clinic surgeon uh, was able to do a pericardectomy uh, and then was able to uh, uh, help losing this much weight and then uh, uh, good quality of life afterwards. And this is how much of the, uh, you know, the pericardium they uh, removed uh, at the time here. So uh, uh, this is a typical uh, 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 pericardectomy. Uh, Dr. Sheff, uh, uh, with a world-renowned uh, 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 surgeon with uh, really a lot of experience of pericardectomy, doing the uh, uh, peric uh, pericardectomy surgery here. And you can see that the thickened pericardium and heart is uh, bulging through the uh, pericardial sac because it's uh, constricted on the very typical appearance of the uh, uh, constrictive heart. And we are now uh, doing almost uh, 60 to 100 pericardectomy in Mayo Clinic. And then after uh, we are recognizing the constriction much, much better, non-invasively, you know, the gentle cardiac catheterization. Now echocardiography can uh, pick many patients up uh, with the constriction. And we are diagnosis of constriction and pericardectomy uh, is uh, uh, accelerated uh, after the, uh, uh, from 19, uh, late 1980s uh, here. Uh, this is a 26-year-old with a previous pericardectomy presenting with a recurrent constriction. And 10% of the uh, 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 patients uh, who, undo, who undergo pericardectomy, uh, they uh, return uh, with a recurrent pericard uh, uh, constricted pericarditis because they did not remove the entire pericardium. So I think it's very important that the surgeon performs the uh, uh, complete pericardectomy, uh, anterior, posterior, diaphragmatic, all the uh, uh, all, you know, all the locations. And I think uh, it's very, very important that the uh, uh, experienced uh, cardiac surgeon performs the pericardectomy to uh, prevent the recurrent uh, constrictive pericarditis uh, in this uh, patient populations. Just a final word, uh, we are uh, 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 we're having quite a challenging time with the COVID and I hope everybody, uh, everyone is doing well and then we uh, recover from uh, this uh, pandemic with the vaccination. And there is a great interest uh, in uh, uh, knowing how much of uh, cardiac disease uh, in patients with COVID-19. And uh, uh, is, it is common to see the LV and RV dysfunction, but the pericardial disease has been uh, shown to be uh, that, not that common. Uh, many case reports, as uh, you see here, uh, uh, you know, but we treat them uh, similar to any other uh, patients with uh, pericarditis. And uh, when you see the early infection with uh, pericarditis, we uh, use colchicin and NSAID. And then if you uh, uh, have a more advanced infection, uh, patients with the COVID, they need a co uh, steroid therapy anyway. And then we uh, use a corticosteroid and also anti-interleukin. Uh, uh, agents like uh, Kineret and Lilonosep that uh, may be uh, necessary in this uh, patient populations there. So this is how we will approach in patients with a pericardial disease uh, and uh, in the setting of uh, uh, COVID-19. So I was trying to uh, uh, emphasize the uh, spectrum of the pericardial disease to you uh, today. And uh, pericarditis is related to the inflammation. Uh, effusion and tamponade is uh, related to the fluid, and then constriction uh, is a scar uh, or some inflammation. But there is a lot of overlap of uh, these uh, uh, conditions of the pericardial diseases. And there are a lot of mimicry because of their symptoms and pre presentations are not, uh, are not uh, specific. It's very non-specific. Chest pain, uh, hypotension, shortness of breath, and edema can be anything, right? So. I think it's multimodality image, imaging is very valuable. Um, echocardiography, CT, cardiac MRI. Uh, and there's uh, some uh, institutions are using even PET scan to look at the uh, pericardial inflammation. Uh, 
and we need to diagnose uh, constriction based on the uh, hemodynamic evaluation by echocardiography or cardiac catheterization. Very important to uh, uh, diagnose uh, effusive uh, constricted pericarditis, recognize it quickly, uh, because it happens uh, in about 20% of patients after pericardiosynthesis, and if you treat that patient early and properly with the uh, NSAID and colchicine, uh, uh, the, the uh, resolution uh, should be possible in almost all patients. Otherwise, patient may need to uh, go ahead with the uh, may need, may require pericardectomy. So. Uh, but in patients with the uh, uh, constriction and chronic uh, stage, uh, pericardectomy is a, a treatment of, of a choice. I just want to recognize the, uh, our uh, uh, pericardial disease team. We have uh, uh, cardiologists, uh, dedicated cardiac surgeons in cardiac pathology, uh, rheumatology, and cardiac imaging, uh, and also the many, many fellows uh, for the last uh, uh, 20, 25 years uh, work on this uh, uh, pericardial uh, disease projects and many data you saw today, uh, product of uh, their effort. I really appreciate uh, their uh, hard work and passion and effort and also the uh, skills that our uh, uh, colleagues have and different disciplines. And then we really work together to make the uh, um, optimal uh, treatment and management and diagnostic uh, strategies uh, for all patients uh, uh, who presents with the uh, one of these uh, pericardial uh, disease uh, conditions.